This week on Arizona Illustrated, the act of generosity behind Tohona Chul. Having a place for people for generations to come with nature, art, and culture was more important than money. The talking mural. The visual culture of this area represents the community. Making the rounds with TPD's Squad 4 team downtown. We all have to live here downtown. We seem to have the same heart for the people on that street. And Arizona Profiles, a Vietnam veteran. Welcome to Arizona Illustrated. I'm Tom McNamara. Most Tucsonans already know Tohono Chul for its 49 acres of lush, beautiful desert, a place where one can stroll along winding paths past soaring saguaros through themed botanical gardens teeming with birds. Did you know that but for the generosity and vision of a Tucson couple, Tohono Chul as we know it might never have existed at all? Tohono Chul is an oasis in an increasingly urbanized environment. It's a place where nature, art, and culture connect. It's a private nonprofit. It's actually the largest piece of private land that's accessible to the public within at least a 12 mile radius. My folks bought this place when they were looking for a house that was bigger than what we had before because they had adopted another child and needed more rooms. It was all natural desert. You don't have any of the botanical garden aspect at all at the time we were growing up. Tohono Chul started with a gift. It started with a gift from the heart from two people who understood that having a place for people for generations to come with nature, art, and culture was more important than, more important than money. I don't remember the year, but what is now the Foothills Mall, the person who built that, wanted to buy this piece of property to put the, the Foothills Mall on. And my parents wanted this kept open space, so they said, no, you, we're not going to sell it. And the developer told them that he would buy my mother a piece of property anywhere she wanted if she would sell this land to him. And she just said, nope. And I'm actually going to turn it into a park. <laughs> which she did. I grew up here since the 1960s until I graduated from college. In the end there were six kids so I imagine it was chaotic <laughs> and we kids just played a lot. It was really fun. Of course the desert surrounded us so that was nice. We could just go out and be wild. We played a lot in this courtyard, all of us. There's a stairway going up to the roof over on the other side which we used every day because we flew the flag and needed to put it up and take it down. And there was a little deck on the roof too where sometimes we would sleep outside. At one point I remember my sister and I setting up jumps and pretending to be horses running around. These tiles, this little bench area was like this when I was a kid with these tiles. What used to be my parents' room is now the gift shop. That gift shop actually extends into the two bedrooms for my brothers along this side of the house. You know, now I go in and I really feel at home because so much of it is still the way it was when we were growing up. It's really been fun to be part of the growth of this from the very beginning. But truly one of the most fun things is when we bring people for lunch at the bistro and Susie will be telling a friend, this is my bedroom. Whoever hears that wants to hear more of that story. Uh, that's just really delightful. I think when people know that something like this came into effect because of the generosity of specific people, I think that's a great message. It's fun to help, to help tell that story. I think that that is the ultimate gift so the rest of us could enjoy what is so unique and special. And that act of generosity, in my humble opinion, generates other acts of generosity. And as you go through the park or preserve, you will see sculptures that have been left for us, 
things that have been left for us as acts of generosity, understanding that the Wilsons gave the original amount to us. We were brought up to think of that as our money. This was their land, um, and we wanted it preserved too. We did not want what was our childhood home to be turned into a mall. It would have been really, really depressing. So the kids were totally fine with it. That was not an issue. Um, I was always worried that it wasn't going to be able to get off the ground, because this was quite a while back, and it was really pretty remote. Not so much now, you know, there's lots and lots of neighbors. But at the time you're thinking, how do we get people out here to actually come and see it? You know, how do we get it known at the time? They knew that there was something here that should be shared. And they gave this place to the community and it's up to us to continue to preserve it. Over the past few years, many colorful murals have been created on the walls and sides of buildings in Tucson. There's a new one that depicts stories from life on South 12th Avenue, and it does something that none of the others do. It talks. Bueno, ahorita en un ratito vamos a empezar la presentación sobre el mural. We just decided to write for this grant, and it worked out that we got it. I feel confused. <laughs> I'm tired, um, but um, I'm really excited about it. We worked so hard. Always glad when we complete a work like this because the whole point of doing public art is to engage the public. People right away notice, oh wait, there's their other business names I recognize. And then I've heard people say, oh, it's South 12th Avenue. This area is heavily settled by Mexican-Americans, um, some who've been here in America for generations, some who've recently come. You'll hear Spanish everywhere. You kind of have to speak Spanish to have a business on the street. Well, it's like a piece of Mexico that's still in Tucson, and it's a part of Mexican culture that has remained because the people who live here have committed to it. When Alex had mentioned she was looking for a wall, she wanted to find a wall that was obviously represented in the book, which is where we took our images from and our stories. People down here really, really like this, and I think because it's kind of represents a lot of, of like where they come from. So if we keep that, then the, the usable space on the wall it shrinks, goes yeah. down a lot. There was another building that we looked at, which seemed a little more complicated, and then I found out that the owners weren't in there anymore, and some hesitation about just the, the location and, and giving a, a mural to a place we weren't sure of the future of it. And for all the sort of effort put into it, it doesn't make sense to put it on, like, you know, on the side. Part. You have been put into years. I already put 40 <laughs> years here, lady. <laughs> okay. This project all started out with a, a larger project of mine called um, Abecedario del Sur, Alphabet of the South. That project is where I took photographs of buildings on the south side of Tucson and then made an alphabet out of them. The visual culture of this area represents the community. And that's why you see this um, amalgamation of beautiful hand-painted signs because that's a tradition from Mexico. Here, it's culture and visuals still married together. And as a designer, um, that excites me. But as a Mexican-American, I also just feel very comfortable and proud of my community. I wanted to work with Alex because I thought she was a brilliant young woman who um, had some really great ideas. She was willing to jump the borders of the downtown arts world into her neighborhood which is a really underserved community as far as um, I could see. When she mentioned Oasis, I didn't really think about what was on the wall already, but I realized that I knew some of the people that had painted it before. It was a long time ago. Most of them are graffiti writers, but they've been around for a long time. I love Tucson, yeah. you know what I mean? 
The day that we were power washing the wall and cleaning up all the old paint, one of the guys who happens to be from New York randomly showed up. That lettering you did on the buffet? I love that. Thank you. I love that. that was we hadn't awesome. gotten his uh, painting off the wall yet, so he was able to take a photo or two and give us his approval. I don't want to say I'm upset, but I, I wish I could have been the one painting it. You know what I'm saying? I'm not upset about it because that's the way it is. That's the way it goes. I hate to see it go, but it was it was kind of time. It was falling, literally falling off the wall. I'm surprised to still see it. It's pretty dope. It, it definitely needs to be painted over. I mean, it's extremely faded. I grew up on the south side. Culture is something that's also tied to community. And sometimes you don't realize what community you came from when you're young, you're just existing. I went to Cornell University for my first degree and was just really in culture shock. And I didn't even know that I could have culture shock. And then when I moved back, I moved back in with my mom. And that's when I started to fall in love with the South Side. I already knew it was going to be a lot of work. I didn't anticipate we would be doing it in the summer when it was a uh, heat wave, 118 degrees one day. So anyway, we've been working nights. I came to Arizona as a kid. My grandparents retired here from New York City. I just connected with it, and I really liked the desert. When I turned 17, I moved out here. I'm a muralist and a scenic painter over the years, sign painter, calligrapher, dabbled in graffiti. I like working large, and I like doing public art, except for the pay part. <laughs> I just love it, it's coming out so beautiful. Yeah, the south side I always tell people is bumping around nine o'clock at night. <laughs> they like it how it is now. You know, when it's done, it's gonna be like. Looks really good. Thank you so much, you know, so much better and so much more. And then there's even the interactive component. I mainly work in watercolor. I've never really worked much with acrylics. So I'm on a huge learning curve for this project. A lot smaller? Yeah, oh. Now. oh. It doesn't look weird. What's so great about acrylic paint is it's extremely forgiving. You can just keep reworking and reworking it. So no, it's not nerve wracking doing it. I think we're nervous about getting it done in time. <laughs> There's always something that seems unfinished to me. But I think we'll be all right. The minute I heard their, their idea, I was all in. My name is Julie Carrizosa. I'm the owner of Oasis Fruit Cones. We have been here since 1983, selling raspados. When they explained to me that it would be a history of the businesses here in South 12th, we're such a close community that I just thought, yes, it's, it didn't seem right to just celebrate one business. Let's celebrate all of them that have been here years serving our community and working with one another. The visuals are representations of portions of each interview with each business. So the menu has all the different businesses who are a part of this project and a QR code that you can scan with your phone and listen to audio. What happened was the car didn't want to start. So the owner said, oh, I can start it. And they let him get in the car to start it and he pumped the gas and it was leaking gas and then hit the spark plug and poof, started the fire. And totally burned air to a crisp, the whole car. <laughs> terrible, terrible. We have a tire shop, a panaderia slash torteria, and then we have a carniceria represented with the cow, also a really big business that's represented on South 12th Avenue. For me, it's more giving back to the community, something that I can leave for my town, my city. Thank you for coming. Thank you, everybody. It all came together and turned out to be such a nice evening. The neatest part is that it's a celebration of us, of our people, of this neighborhood, of the communities.
The Tucson Police Department is actively engaged in an effort to build stronger bonds with the community it serves. So we spent some time with the Squad 4 team in the downtown district as they made their rounds. Here we have the T3 Motions. It's an electric vehicle, three-wheeled vehicle. It allows the officers to get in and out through traffic on the sidewalks. They're quiet. She's ready to go. Uh, most of the officers are mountain bike certified. Dealing with people, you can stop and talk to somebody much easier than in a patrol car where you got to find a place to park it. And they're great tools for crowd control when they have marches and parades where we can follow alongside of them. Sergeant Mickey Peterson is a patrol supervisor for the night squad. They are officers who serve in the downtown area, now known as the district. So a, a big part of what we're trying to do is show them we're out here and just have daily contact and interactions with the public. Get out there and talk to people and see what's going on, let them know what we're doing. This effort to be more directly engaged with the community is just part of the department's new direction. The Tucson Police Department is one of 15 model agencies chosen to advance President Obama's 21st century policing initiative. These jurisdictions are now receiving federal resources and support to develop and implement best practices that can then be shared and adopted by departments nationwide. The agencies were chosen in part for having already moved forward in new and innovative ways. I've been here since 2 o'clock. Have you really? Oh my word. Under a leaner budget, with planned attrition in the current ranks, new police chief Chris Magnus leads the effort to build stronger bonds with the community. I think it's hard when you have that sense that you're never going to see the same police officer twice, you know. People want that to change. So I'm hearing that people have a high degree of confidence in our department, but they would like to have stronger relationships with a predictable group of officers who really are familiar with their neighborhood, the schools, the businesses, the nonprofits in their areas, and that's definitely the direction we're headed. It's a show or what is it? Oh, we're right here, we're at the intersection of Congress, Tool, and Fourth Avenue. They call it the Triangle. Everything kind of converges. It's the center point of the newly created district. So we're seeing a lot more investment down here, and with that investment, we're seeing a lot more people spending time down here, coming to the restaurants, the clubs, hanging out, uh, spending money. It, it's just booming down here. Uh, this is Officer Lushbaugh and Officer Shrouder. These are Squad 4, part of the downtown district. An important part of this team-oriented approach is making contact and being seen. You have a great day, guys. Bye, guys. We just started this at the beginning of April, end of March. So this, this approach itself, when we eliminated the downtown division, uh, was really to get out here and have this high visibility team that we have, which became the downtown district. I just want to know where to go. Though. We've seen a lot of trust within the public, and I know John shares that. You want to make sure you're at visible. You want to make sure you're walking around. You're not just sitting in a car or off oh, in a yeah. corner somewhere. You want to be out talking to people. Well, good luck. Um, when we talk to each other, we talk about police things. Obviously, we're still police officers. We have to perform a police function. Talk about who's doing what, what we've heard in the street. You know, there are problems. There are six primary areas of focus in President Obama's policing initiative, known as pillars. The first of those is building trust and legitimacy. One way of building trust is by just being present. Well, in an area like this, you get so much foot traffic, so many people moving around from other parts of town, um, from all over, from other countries, from other states. It's good to be visible and show the people we can talk to them, and that we're just ordinary people trying to do a, a difficult job, but we're there for them. That we listen to their little problems, like where to park, or bigger problems about somebody shoplifting or whatever it might be. They might not call 911 for that, but they'll tell us. You know, and the bigger things. We've caught people here who committed serious crimes just because somebody felt comfortable with us to come up and tell us. What do you got going on tonight? We are sponsoring the show tonight. We're getting the word out about uh, I agree with John that it's important that the public sees what we're doing, why we're doing it, um, and, and that we are out here trying to keep everybody safe. And that, it, that we're a team out here, really. That's the idea behind community policing is that we're working together, that the community is part of it. We're just one part of that. Hi. Because I work for the fire department in Las Vegas, so I always go out of my way to say. We want them to get out there, know the business owners, know the employees in the businesses, and know the regulars down here. And, and that way they get an idea of what's normal, what's regular behavior, when something's out of the ordinary, when they need to take action. One business that area locals patronize is a community market called Johnny Gibson's. 
a full-service grocery store complete with deli and grill. Paul Sizek is co-owner and general manager. Well, as a business owner, we see them as an essential service, as an essential partner in us uh, fulfilling our mandate, and our mandate is to serve. Thank you. Have a good day. We're here to be a blessing to this community, and the police seem to have that same uh, mindset. Yeah. I haven't seen them in a long time. I do sense, though, because of the communications we've had, that they are taking a little bit different approach, perhaps, than they did in the past. Turns out today was a good day to stop in. Park over on 12? Yeah. That, that gentleman's been in here many times. He's stolen from us on several occasions. He has a problem with substance abuse. Uh, and he's been trespassed from here, but forgets or chooses not to adhere to that trespass. This is the second time in two days that I had to deal with someone, and the police were there that second. I don't know if that's what kismet or what, but that's why you want a police department that's boots on the ground and right there, not just cruising in a car. And they do it in a way that keeps a good feeling in the, in the community firm, yet compassionate, and I really, really appreciate that because we all have to live here downtown. The cool thing is we seem to have the same heart for the people on that street. As day turns to night, officers Lushbaugh and Shrouder continue their rounds in the district and in some ways set the tone. Helping with the general mood in the night. If, if we walk around and they can see that we're happy and interacting, you hope that the vibe of the night just continues to be very positive for everybody. There are people down here who have had problems with police officers who just would walk past and yell at me or flip me off. But I've had the opportunity down here to, to actually stop them and talk with them. And once you talk for a while, all of a sudden they understand me and I understand them. So it's really about building the trust by, by just speaking with each other. And down here, at least, we have the opportunity to do that. Hey! How's it hey. going? Hey. Yeah, how you doing, man? All is well? Yes. So you guys got a band tonight, too? Yeah, we got like a country band at 10. Bad thing about having one interest. Yeah. <laughs> the bands are always like, where do I load in? It's like, here. You're looking at it. Hey, guys. Hey, you. Hey, what's up, bro? How you doing, man? Good to see you. Yeah, Thursdays, you guys are back on track for Thursdays, huh? Take care. All right. See you, I just want to say hi and say I saw you on TV. Yeah, he's always like a welcome face to see because usually you associate cops like, oh man, something's wrong. But he always just is always chill, very calm. Just says, hey, if there's ever a problem, he's like always there to respond to it. I love it. It reminds me of like the old timey, you know, cop who's more interested in like getting to know the people rather than being the presence when he's called. You know, like he already knows the people he's going to go home. So. All right, go ahead. Your average police officer out there in the streets doing the same thing we are, they just don't have the luxury of being able to come out and talk to people. We're, we're lucky. You guys enjoy your night, eh? And so this form of policing continues in downtown Tucson. Cops on the beat, business owners, families, students, and those down on their luck sharing the same space, parts of the same community. I, I've been surprised with the reaction that we get. It's, it's what I hoped for in policing coming out here. You want to feel good about your, what you're doing at the end of the day. And I wanted to be proud about what I was doing. And if part of that is serving in a community, it's a great place to start. And now, Arizona Profiles, a series of personal recollections, moving memories, and little-known Arizona stories. Born in Douglas, Arizona, Dick Keith tried to enlist in the Marine Corps, but his eyesight was too poor. Not to be deterred, he became a Navy corpsman and in Vietnam was able to serve alongside Marines in combat, attending to their wounds. One of the first things I remember flying into Da Nang Airport was stepping off the plane. There was smoke everywhere. It was on fire. You know, it was purely a volunteer being a corpsman was purely volunteer at that point, so our numbers were not great. When I first got there, I was given what was called a Unit 1, and a Unit 1 is a special bag that you carry all your, your medical supplies in, from battle dressings to morphine, everything you needed. Well, 
it, it took a Marine, when he saw me with my Unit 1, he said, Doc, you gotta get rid of that. They know what that is. So he took me to an ammo bunker and found me an ammo bag. He says, you put everything in here. He says, you need to look like us. So they gave me an M16 and a 45 pistol and I threw away the Unit 1. First of all, I wanted to see what kind of wound they had, and you know, and I mean, you know, I've, I've stuck my fingers and thumbs in holes to stop the bleeding. Um, you know, some of the worst were amputation. If somebody tries to get up and look at their legs, well, that's something you don't want them to see, so you keep them down flat. I treated several Marines that lost an arm or leg, and it's 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 a uh, it's not a good feeling. Oh. Oh. Unfortunately, we lost Marines over there too, so. We went into what was called Pipestone Canyon. It was an operation. And um, we went in with 150 men and um, 66 were wounded, N not gravely, you know. They were still walking, they got hit and everything. Uh, but of those 66, only six of them were gunshot wounds. They were all booby traps in that particular operation. What are your memories of the Vietnam War? Share your story with us by visiting our website, azpm.org slash Vietnam. This September, watch for the new AZPM original documentary, Arizona and the Vietnam War, and an epic 10-part, 18-hour film series, The Vietnam War, from directors Ken Burns and Lynn Novick, in September on PBS6. Thank you for joining us on Arizona Illustrated. Next week, to focus, to be calm and aware, is to meditate. The only way that you can really learn to benefit others is if you learn to tame your own mind first. An ancient watering practice renewed. How can you grow food and still cut down on your water? A visit to Everybody Gallery. It's important to me that it exists, and hopefully that will encourage more people to do something similar too. And Arizona Profiles, a Vietnam veteran. I'm Tom McNamara. See you then.